The ceiling mics are on, uh, participants on the phone. I assume this is being heard. If not, please uh, write it down. I don't know how that's going to work. Um, welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to have Joe Friedman um, from a lot of places. Um, he's an uh, adjunct assistant professor of EX, um, electrical engineering and computer science. Um, he's a data science, principal data scientist at Livermore and also a bit senior fellow. And he's going to be talking about um, neural network, sizing neural network experiments. I thought it was going to be capacitive, but we'll see. Which is all related. OK, yeah. good. So, yeah, thanks very much for, for inviting me over. Um, uh, yeah, so I, a little more, I mostly enjoy working with physicists. And when you go present them machine learning, then often the answer is, and then I understand what. And that actually led me to like say, okay, let's go in and, and treat it like engineering. Let's start measuring it. Um, and the question is, of course, what to measure uh, beyond accuracy. So this is what this is about. Uh, this is about me. I've done a bunch of AI for, for a long, long time. Um, so this is, for example, something I did for my, for my PhD a while ago, 2006. It's still in the game, just to automatically extract foreground from background. Uh, much of the more later work in mostly in multimedia was creating a purpose and an infrastructure to uh, to basically give access to 100 million images and, and a million videos for research and not just give access of course it can dump you a petabyte of data the major point is make it so that students can actually work with it for example automatic location estimation so as part of that and this is how this all started apart from the other physicist story is that we have a very good relationship with Amazon. And Amazon gives us compute for the students saying, okay, fine. And then they ask me, oh, we want to do another one of these cool things where it's a Python Jupyter notepad that integrates with 100 million images for retrieval. And they said, okay, fine, but what's the budget that you need? I was like, that's a good question. It's a very good question because when I look at ImageNet, these are the three main contenders of ImageNet. Like you know, but this is so AlexNet has a 238 megabyte model and uses uh, two billion operations to train. Darknet has a 28 megabyte model and uses less than one billion operations to train. And BGG 16 is double the size of AlexNet and uses 10 times more than AlexNet to train. So that's a two order of, of magnitude discrepancy in sort of 5% accuracy. Um, wait a minute, that's too much. And I was like, you know, you need to find something that's better than, I mean, it's truly hard to find something better than two orders of magnitude for budgeting these experiments. And the big trick, the big trick is not so much for me, the big trick is from a book from David McKay that I actually had, <laughs> he only wrote two books, one popular and one science book that I had on my shelf for a long time before I started reading it again. It's called Information Theory, uh, Inference and, and Learning Algorithm. And the interesting one is chapter 40. Chapter 40, he does something that's really, really interesting. He goes and says, what if we train a machine learner with random points? All we do is we say, we take uniformly random points and we want to know what are the mappings that the machine learner can still memorize, because you can't infer anything from random points. You really can't. So what this means is, yeah, memorization is kind of your worst case, generalization. I can give you a number, 529654. It's my number, sorry. But the point is, what can you say about these numbers? Nothing. But if I give you 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, you're going to say, ha, plus 2, right? And it's like, here we go. Just infer something because these numbers are not random. You infer the rule. Now, all you need to store is plus 2, not 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And the funny thing is, if I give you 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, you want to say, stop it, I got it already. Right? But that's what we're doing with our little networks right now, because we don't know, you know how much data they need. Do we give you too much data? And so on. So the interesting thing is, using more power, the other way, though, is using more power than is needed for memorization is a waste of resources, obviously. And I can't ask Amazon for two or magnitude discrepancy. $10,000 versus a million dollars for the budget makes a difference. Okay? And using as many parameters as needed for memorization is usually called overfitting. And reducing parameters, however, below memorization capacity, that gives us evidence for what we call generalization. And I will show you how this can all be measured. So before we go there, 
I mean, this is the old Ultimately, supervised machine learners have what I call a memory equivalent capacity in bits. This memory, you can measure that in bits. That is computable and measurable. Okay, you can empirically do experiments, but you can also just go analytically sometimes, not always. Artificial neural networks with scaling functions, all of these have a capacity upper limit that can be determined analytically using four principles, just like capacitors. I'll show you this. An effective capacity can also be measured for actual implementation. You can just go and say measure. Measuring takes a while, but it works. And predicting and measuring that capacity, first of all, allows you for task independent comparison of different machine learners. It's sort of like an IQ. Okay. And what could I learn with this thing without knowing the task? And then capacity requirement can also be approximately predicted given a machine learner and uh, a training data that I have. Okay. So what I do is I use a stupid machine learner, a learning impaired machine learner, and approximate how well could I get once I once I make this not so stupid. And that gives us a measure of generalization. Okay. Basically, the generalization is the correctly classified points divided by the memory equivalent capacity. And that's in bits per bit. Okay. Now you can <coughs> say, hey, we are, our expected, it's an expectation, obviously. Our expected generalization is this. Okay, before we go there, let's start with real basic stuff. Okay. So repeat memory. Memory is this. We have a Boolean variable, we, we call Boolean variable called runtime form logic. Can assume one of two states, right? The means sigma is usually what we call an alphabet, is all the states it can assume, or all the symbols. Symbols are states, right? So V is a 0 0.1, the means in our alphabet size is 2. Now, n Boolean variables, and we can call them headers, right? Could just be called parameters, and n configuration means that you have two to the top n possible states, okay? If you have two variables, you have four states. So, now memory cell, when we build them, each of them has two equiparable states. That means they're nothing else but a Boolean parameter. And obviously, we have this measure we call bit. That means what we do is we say, well, we take the log two of that. It's just one binary digit, zero or one, which is the same as the fractal dimension. I can say fractal because if you do log two or three, it's not an even dimension, it's, it's actually a fractal dimension. But also, that log two actually, what we do here is this is our self similarities, and this log magnifier, it actually corresponds to better one more fractal dimension. You can look that up. But what is more interesting for us right now is information is reduction of uncertainty, which is exactly clear in the, in the equation itself. What you say is, well, you know this, physicists know this is Boltzmann entropy, then you pay t in front, you say information minus log 2p, p is some probability. Now, probability can be distributed in some way, but the worst case is it's actually distributed. That means minus log 2, 1 divided by the number of states. Now, here's what's interesting. If we are information theory, statistics, all of this, we will go and say, oh yeah, but there's a better measure of Shannon entropy. Yes gives you a tighter bound, but it also has another problem, which is you need to assume something, which is A, infinity, and B, you kind of need to know the partitioning. But what if I say, I really only care about the worst case. I want to really guarantee that whatever the distribution is, I can put stuff in. Well, then you just do memory. Memory, you can use the logarithm law and go from this non-deterministic idea, which is this is a probability, to completely deterministic. All you say is log two of the number of states. Because that's lower than loss. Right. So minus log 2, 1 divided by x is log 2 of x. That's high school. Now, they also gives you often when I say, what do you want to quantify uncertainty? Well, yeah, it's my negative bits, the information I don't have. Done. OK. So again, if states are not equally probable, you can get a tighter bound, but you also pay with assumptions. That was memory. Now let's talk about the perceptron. So the perceptron itself, what is that thing doing? Well, what this thing is doing is you have a dot product. So these are your input points, xi. This is basically like one point, and then xi is the dimensions of one point. So you think this as on the table. Each, each row is a point, and the columns are the xi. 
right? So the first point, the second point is on, different XI. So now what you do is you can choose weights WI to just multiply in, you get a dot product. What you do is you ask yourself, is that dot product greater than a chosen, is that dot product greater than a chosen B, which is a bias, okay? That's all you're doing. And that gives you that nice data function. And guess why? Why are we actually doing this? Why are we actually doing this? Why, what is the perception really doing just to get a science connection? Well, the perceptron was invented by two people in parallel. First of all, Rosenblatt, who called it the perceptron. But then there was somebody else, Bernard Vedro in Stanford, still alive, <laughs> decided, I want to create a, a, an element that instead of switching by a signal, which would be like a transistor, the base signal switches a big current. No, we don't switch based on the signal, we switch based on an energy. That means a signal times time. So we wait until there's enough energy and then we switch. Guess what? That's exactly what a neuron does. You only think about your left pinky toe with a step on Your neuron is filtering out information that's irrelevant. And of course, that's the whole point. And that dot product is nothing else, but the interface of the dot product is something else but an energy. So it's an energy set. Now, what about these activation functions? It turns out they do matter in practice, practically, but all they ever do, except from the linear one, if you take the identity function or some linear non sort of long threshold function, you will see that Kirchhoff's laws completely describe neural networks. That's not interesting because all you have is capacitors. But if you take something that resembles a data function, actually what it does is it approximates it. So do you get more information out of an approximation or do you get more information out of the real thing? Obviously of the real thing. So that means we treat every of these activation functions, and there are way too many, just as an approximation of the delta function. And remember that was what it was anyway. We created them to make that propagation possible because we needed some smoothness. Okay, so now let's talk about this. This has been done before, okay? People were thinking, how many functions can I actually implement using the perceptron? This was a huge thing. Uh, especially uh, Minsky wrote a lot about it. And he was really, 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 really disappointed that you cannot implement all 16 Boolean functions of two variables in a single perceptron. I will show you a little bit. If I don't have a whiteboard, something would be useful. It is a whiteboard. Oh, there's a whiteboard? Everything behind you is a whiteboard. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will show you a little bit how, how you get there in a way easier way than Minsky. But in any way, point is, what you do really is you have one linear separator, right? And that's the standard knowledge. You have a linear separator, and what can you do with a linear separator, right? You can do all these kind of things. So if you do all of these kind of things on Boolean variables, you will figure something out. It's going to restart itself instead of start that process. Okay. It's, not, it's not a prompt. I don't control this, but I have <laughs> okay. This is the thing that I was asking the guy. It was like, is it doing this good thing? And he said, well, you can be done. I see. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, that is better. Okay. So we are sorry for people who are remote. Um, and that will go away. Um, I see. Okay. Go. So we, we have a little bit of this. So here's, here's the two Boolean variables, right? Four states. And then, of course, of those four states, you can choose any other column to be uh, sort of your, your result of your function for Boolean variables. And that means you get 2 to the power of 2 to the power of V possible labelings. Oh, now well, this is a labeling, right? Because it's arbitrary. Uh, of V Boolean variables, right? Or of 2 to the power of V points. So the point is 1 point, 2 point, 3 point, 4 points. Okay. So now it turns out they tried whatever they could. And also, Schleff in 1852 already showed it without knowing what a neuron is. Uh, of the 15 functions you can generate from two Boolean variables, you can implement 14 with a single neuron, and two you cannot. And these two are not by coincidence XOR and not XOR. Not XOR is equality. If you could somehow shortcut equality, ooh, that would be interesting. Now you need to compare every single bit to, to say something is equal. So, now McKay. Generalize this and said, here's what we'll do. We'll think about this as a communication problem. Okay, so you have the Shannon thing, which gives you sender, message, encoder, signal, and so on. 
So what he said is this, if you think about this, you have a sender that sends some labels. It's a label for these variables, right? So the last column of the table. And, and asks with, with the points present <coughs> to have a machine learning, machine learner encode this as weights, we call them, we call them parameters, okay? Now what we do is we send them over a channel that we don't care about, identity channel. But now when we decode, and this is again memorization, when we decode, we have those weights, and we also have the same data again, because again, it's testing or training, just for memorization. Then what we'll do is we say, okay, we decode this thing. The question now is, we get, of course, labels prime out. The question, however, is, when is labels prime equal labels, right? So under which condition can a neuron, as memory, encode all the labeling that I could ask it for? Because for two variables, with two sets of labels that it cannot do. So what's the general thing? Now, I encourage you to read chapter 40 in McKay, but the summary of this is this. He says, look, here's what we can do. You train the network with random points, and then he actually analytically derives all of this, okay? This is not an empirical result. So he says this, so here's what's interesting. This is how this behaves. So N is the number of points you might want to label. By the way, the dimensionality of those points does not matter because, as you know, each, X, each dimension creates a new way to do it, okay? So now here's what's interesting. So what you do is you take, you say you want to label n points. How many parameters do I need? That means weights plus bias. How many parameters do I need to be able to label n points? Okay? And he takes the quotient n divided by k. Which one was it? And which one was it? N is the number of points you want to label, and K is the number of parameters yeah, in your network. Okay? Now he says, well, now we plot this against accuracy. Of course, if I'm at 100% accuracy, yes, it works. And it turns out when N divided by K is 1, you can absolutely guarantee um, you can label it. So these points are randomly chosen, okay? Random position. With N points in whatever position and whatever you choose that as long as you have the same number of points as you have the number of weights, you can guarantee everything can be learned, even perfect training. If you can't, your training has a problem. That's a different story. But again, you talk about memorization for now. Okay. Now the next thing you do is you go to the second one. And that's what actually Kovo in 1965 wrote an interesting paper about. That is the supremum of the mutual information, the information capacity in infinity, not the asymptote. And it turns out it's kind of funny because even for random points, we kind of can compress a little bit, even when they're random, to the point where if you have twice the number of points, then you have number of weights, you get this 50% accuracy. Okay, 50% for a binary classifier is obviously the cutoff, right? But the point is, this is an interesting range. Now, most work concentrates on this interesting range, right? The way to think about this is, it, I mean, there's also like, what's the maximum? The maximum is you stay under this asymptote and so on. There's a bunch of work in that ground. <clears throat> I don't care. I'm an engineer. I want to give a guarantee. That means the thing that I care about for now is this, okay? But the biggest problem that I have with this is, this is for a single neuron. Nobody uses a single neuron to solve a machine learning problem. What I want to understand is something like this. Okay. However, be careful. If you start creating a theory, you got to be really making sure you create a theory about the right thing because that is what we think of as a network. But there's other ways to do this. For example, you cannot solve X or with a single neuron, but you can solve it with this typical MLP, which is just a single layer, which you can also solve with this. And that's a very interesting one because the number of neurons here is much smaller than here. And you still can solve it. And it turns out that is called a shortcut network. It's been known to the neural network community for decades. Facebook reinvented it and called it ResNet. Okay. So now, why does ResNet work slash shortcut network? First is this. Why is this better? <coughs> I know, but for now we don't. Okay. So the first thing I said was okay. Well, let's think about memory, right? So what really memory is, is this. It's an identity function, right? So you have n Boolean variables that can be in any 
a distribution, and memory, all it needs to do is reproduce them. F of x is x. Okay. Now, when we see a machine learner, and what I really usually concentrate on is, is a binary classifier, we have this situation. F of x is a y, right? It's 0, 1. So the question that I say is, oh, by the way, regression uh, doesn't exist for me. Okay, for me, I'm counting in bits. Regression just means you have a lot of bits here. Yeah, okay, so by, the more classes you have, the more you tend towards regression. Different story. But let's keep it to binary classifiers for now. So what I'm saying is, let's define this, the memory equivalent capacity which is the number of configurations of uniformly distributed input that a machine learner can guarantee to label correctly, right? So that's, first of all, a cool definition, but what can I do with this? Well, first of all, I can determine, this is another publication from a website that I sent, I can determine the memory equivalent capacity for an arbitrary network by following these four rules. First one is, well, the output of a neuron is fine or non fine. Well, it would be one bit, maximally. Could be less because it might not be accurate distributed fine or non fine. But maximally, it could be accurate distributed, so that means one bit. So let's assume the output of a perceptron is one bit. Then we take my case result and we say, well, the maximum memory for the capacity of a perceptron is the number of parameters. Remember, n divided by k equals one. Just take that result. And then we needed two more results that were a lot more work than this from the book. <laughs> the first one was we started very empirical, and I show you the recurse for that that were really interesting. And it turns out the maximum memory capacity of perceptron in parallel is all you know, very complicated. It's additive, okay? It makes total sense. So let's say you have one perceptron, which has three bits of capacity, and you have another perceptron that has the same input, but has independent weights and you can buy us, well, obviously, that just adds another three parameters that's completely additive. But then, and that was a lot, a lot harder. What do we do with those layers? How do we stack those layers? And there's a guy called Tishby. Um, he said, hey, you got to take into account the data processing inequality, which is you can create information along the way as you go deeper. It's f of f of f of f of x. And it's like, yeah, well, then we just apply that. So what we do is we say the maximum memory capacity of a layer of perceptrons, depending on a previous layer of perceptrons, is limited by the maximum output in bits of the previous layer. Okay? So I think now you need some examples. Let's do some examples. First of all, single perceptron, three bits, pretty simple. One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> Next one is this one, right? So what we have is one, two, three, plus one, two, three, three plus three in parallel is two times three is six bits, okay? Problem with six bits now has two outputs. Now two outputs are two bits of output, one, two. And for fun, because it makes it more interesting, I did not put a bias in this one. And that means this thing only has a capacity of two bits. So this now is the bottleneck, just for fun, and so it would Two bits, sorry, this is min two three wrong. Okay, sorry, no, this is nothing else but six plus two is eight. Okay, but it's not min. Uh, this is this is the not limiting because it's two bits up and not two bits. Sorry. Next one. Now this is very much interesting. This is what you want to get. Now, here's what happens. This is three bits again. One, two, three. This is three bits again. One, two, three, six bits. Okay. Now, what happens here? How many bits of output does this neuron have? One. Why? How do we create bits? That's the problem. You cannot. It fires or not fires. You duplicate the signal. Right? It fires or not fires. So you duplicate the signal. I don't care how many outputs you have. It's the same bit. Right? So now, with that, you have one, two bits of input here. Right? So one bit from here, one bit from here, one bit from here, one bit from here. And that means that in reality, while this would have six bits of capacity, you can only work with two bits. Who needs six bits of capacity when you only get two bits? So really what matters is that you take the minimum, you say it's two, 
right? And yes, what do you think? I think about making this very deep layer here, it doesn't do anything. By the way, if you want to try all of this arithmetic out, there's a demo on the web to your middle.exigo.edu. You put in data, it gives you the capacity to try this out, and you see that if you add neurons this way, you're all going to learn the same thing. It's completely redundant. Because out of the two bits, you cannot create more bits. So now this means you get the minimum of two, and then give another three bits here. So you get a total of 11 bits. Okay? So that's what it is. Um, there's nothing you can do. Um, it's data processing equality. Now, how do we explain ResNet? <coughs> we explain ResNet by saying, well, guess what's interesting here? This is three bits again, nothing new. Now we go here and say it's one output, but there's two bits coming input from somewhere completely different. That means this thing basically makes an informed decision, right? It's basically looking at the two bits coming from the input and another bit that has been processed by another neuron. Perfect, informed decisions are the best. Uh, what this means is we get seven bits capacity despite the fact that we actually have them stacked. And this is, there's a paper about the deepest neural networks where the argument is if you stack them this way, it's the most efficient way you can deal with them. And the total is totally right. All you need to do is count the bits. Okay. So now it's also cool, it's always cool to have some theory, but let's try this out empirically. So what you have here is and this is so funny, it looks just like the McKay curve again, right? Remember the end of K? That's the same curve. Except now, we actually scale the input dimension and we also scale the number of neurons in the middle. So this is the three layer MLP where we actually just do the mass and simulate it, right? With the mass that I just gave you. Um, it looks like this. And now the question, obviously, that's the theory. How does the practice look like? And in practice, you get the absolute same curve. So this is scikit-learn, a three-layer MLP, an SVAT hidden nodes. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, this is some grisliness because you had to sample a bunch of stuff, but this is how this looks like. Now, here's my problem. We tested machine learners that caved in here. Would you trust the machine learner like this? I would. I would at least want it to be able to memorize what I give it my random points. If not, obviously, get to closer to more and more of the theoretical. Guess what? Nobody debugs neural networks this way. Nobody ever checks on the fact that also neural networks are just programs that have a bunch of bugs. And I can, I, you know, this is recorded, but I can give you a list of neural networks I do not trust. And these are part of some of them well known to the image community to be, oh, yeah, this kind of doesn't work. Yeah, I accept. So this is scikit-learn. I can tell you it's the best curve we got. I use it for everything now. It's awesome. The long-standing implementation part of Python gets forgotten over all the hype of TensorFlow. Just saying. TensorFlow isn't bad, by the way. But this is the best. So now we can characterize and debug and compare uh, neural networks. That's something. But I didn't want to stop there, because my problem is now this. I am a data scientist. So I get a table of some data, right? So give me a table and say, learn this. Can we abstract from this? What can be generalized? So for example, each experiment costs a lot of money. What is each experiment? Well, each experiment is a row of kind of variables that you tune for the experiment and then the result, right? What if each experiment is a million dollars? Wouldn't it be super cool to say, well, we were kind of affording 50 of them, but can we start to generalize and see which parameters we don't need to tune, which parameters can we already predict, which, which, what's the influence of them, and also what's the generalization? Yes, that's what I'm looking for. So, here's my idea for this. You get a data and you get labels. How much actual capacity do I need to memorize the table, right? That's like a compression. It is a compression. Now, what I do is, let's build a memorization network where only the biases are trained. So I said here, obviously, if I need to train a whole network, then I, I set myself up with the whole thing. But that doesn't work because I want to find out how big the whole thing is. So here's what I do. I say, there's actually a way, this is also presented in the paper, how we can actually create a memorization network that will memorize everything with very high accuracy, 98%, everything but hash collisions, really. It's basically like a hash table. But I only need to train the biases. I don't need to train any weights. I set the weights to all to one. 
that gives you some what I call a learning impaired network. Now I use that learning impaired network because it's n log n. I really only need to sort. It's real fun. Remember also, memorization only allows for permutations. What's the best way to permutate? n log n. It's called sorting. Okay. If you memorize, there shouldn't be anything more needed than permutation because otherwise you can't go back. Memorization means going back and forth, right? So the expected case is then, so I get this stupid network, and the next question I have to ask is, okay, if the network wasn't stupid, if I actually had give the full freedom to the parameters, what would be the expected, what would exponential training buy us? Okay, so this is the algorithm, which I can't go through, but here's a concrete algorithm that you can totally use to create a dumped network in n log n time. And the most important output for this algorithm is a capacity, obviously, in terms of the number of neurons you need in this middle layer, okay? Now I ask myself, okay, so I have a dumb network where all of you are reading sum and threshold, sum and threshold, sum and threshold. But what happened if I wiggled out the optimum using the weights? And that's a good question. So the dumb network is highly inefficient in terms of representing the points because it's dumb, okay? It just takes a lot more time to be and it's mostly 100% accurate, but for real world data, but obviously you can create cases where uh, you have hash collisions and all these kind of things. Um, but the, the way I think about it is if, if you have a collision, who cares? That's what I have training for. So I just count another neuron in, okay? All I need to do is count neurons. Now, the interesting part is that I said, okay, now I have a dump hash table. What would be the most the smartest hash table I can build. Just don't think about back propagation. Don't think about all of this. Think about what would be, if I give you something to memorize, points in a database, what data structure comes to mind? No, not <laughs> binary try. Hmm? That's right. It's not so bad. I don't, actually, that might work. Uh, what, what is it? Binary search tree. Perfect. Binary search tree, but also the B tree. Right, a B tree is a binary structure that stores initial values at each point, which is exactly what a neural network will do because these are the weights. It's weak amounts so that you can have the comparison. So a B tree scales logarithmically in the size of the points. So what I'm assuming is that my thing is scales linearly, and then you take the log of the number of neurons, and you have a B tree in the best case. Again, you're just memorizing. And it turns out that gives you a prediction that I tried with a bunch of things. First of all, on end, it says you need two bits, which is actually right. On XOR, it says you need four bits, which is right, because it can't be done in one. It can't be done in one neuron. You need two neurons or more. One is three bits, is only one neuron. And so the validation is actually training a real network with the same capacity. And now I'm going to skip a couple. These are just academic examples, but I used ImageNet too. I said 2,000 images in two classes. Now, you have all this noise, right? So what I said, OK, Alex created this layer. AlexNet, fine. I use JPEG. I trust this, but much more. So we go to JPEG quality 20. We have a whole set of experiments, how you replace the convolutional layer with JPEG, because JPEG is just much more elaborate on this. So JPEG quality 20 gives you about one bit per pixel. And what you do then is you take that data and put it into the algorithm. And it turns out that the expected capacity requirement to memorize these 2,000 images differences is 10 kbit. It's not small. But then I tried to actually train a real network with 10 kbit capacity. And I got to 98.2 accuracy. In fact, the moment I increased this, it just took a lot longer to train. And the moment I decreased this, I never got to the accuracy. So that number was much better than I ever hoped it would get. All these results, please, they're all online, repeatable. Test them out, question them, send me email, OK? Because I don't, I don't do magic. It's all, including all the parameters that represent this network, OK? It's all. So now. So sorry, um, the, the, the real dimension I data set has tens of hundreds of classes. Yes. Uh, do you have a sense for how things might scale? Yeah. Scale? My scaling would be 10, 10 kbit per 
tuple of classes you want to compare, right? So now we want to go to generalization, though, because all we talked is memorization. So memorization is worst case generalization. This is how I started, right? It's a typical problem also. Again, this 529 number versus 2468. But the other one is if you ever had an oral exam with a student and you ask him a question and the textbook answer comes like, bum. Yeah, did he memorize or does he actually understand it? <laughs> the answer is, did he generalize or does he actually just memorize? So now, here's the thing. The good news is real-world data is not random, right? That's the whole point. We tried with random points. Nothing is ever random, OK? And that means that our information capacity is actually a little bit bigger than one bit per parameter, not only from Kovo and McKay, but also in general. Um, that means we should be able to use less parameters than predicted by the memory capacity calculations. If you use more, you're really just wasting time. Okay. Now, then I give you this process where I say, well, what I do now, this is actually what I do practical. Now, practically, I started my approximation and I figure out I need to really get to something like 98% accuracy. Training is never perfect. If not, then I increase parameters. Actually, it never happened in all the practical experiments I did. And this is now October 4th that this came up. So this is now over half a year. Then I had to increase parameters. Okay, it actually worked. So then we try and iteratively and decrease capacity by testing against the validation set. That's the same thing we've been doing. But the trick is to maintain accuracy as much as you can while reducing capacity. Now, parameter reduction is well known. People know we need to reduce parameters. But the trick is, we know already from the calculations that I showed you earlier when I went through the bits, that parameters in different positions of the network have different capacity influence, right? So you need to think about memory capacity. And there's another point. People go, what about regularization? Yes, regularization reduces the freedom of the parameters by some way of doing it, early stopping, dropout, all of this. It's the same as a capacity reduction, right? You could either take the parameter explicitly out, or you just say, oh, individual parameter doesn't have full freedom. Same thing. Now, you stop at the minimum capacity uh, for the best head of set accuracy. You're going to see a curve, sorry. You're going to see a curve that looks like this, right? So if you draw here, <coughs> so this is your accuracy. And this is your capacity that is increasing or decreasing. Then for your training set, you would, if these were random points, you're still going to random points. If I'll show you in a bit, if not, you would expect that it happens like this. I have a whole explanation of why this has to look like this for a training set, for memorizing the training set. Now, as you would put in a test set, which is assumed, and hopefully, please make sure it is completely independent, okay? Then, you would expect actually 50% as of McKay to start, and then it goes up like this and falls down again. Okay, so you want to stop here. That's your point of optimal optimality. With highest accuracy for the minimum capacity. After that, you kill too much. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't understand. For the test set of random numbers. Why do they ever exceed 50% oh, accuracy? That's not any more random numbers, sorry. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you so much. You paid attention. <laughs> so, this is your random numbers, okay? Now, if they were not random, this would just go a lot longer. That's the point, okay? You go longer. And now, for that, a lot longer curve it will look like this for your test site. <coughs> thank you for paying attention. That was, thank you. That's good. So, for now, what I'm saying is this. First of all, why do you care? Well, we, we get all these NVIDIA chips. We get all these Amazon gives us almost computing for free. Well, first of all, for how long? But also, really, we do care. And I tell you why. Not only is it a waste of money, energy, and time, and bad for the environment. And yes, you pay, you get paid for parameter tuning. Maybe that's not bad for me. Well, but here's the problem. You have two more publications. One is that <laughs> the problem is that you you, if you have too many parameters, one parameter too much basically gives you an unpresentable example right away. So we, we, we tested a thing. We basically just we try to avoid with brute force one extra parameter, but you don't see how to tune it because you don't have it in the input data. There's no way to avoid an unpresentable example. Check this out. The other one was, and that's the major point. How come it's amazing? Less parameters just give you a much higher chance to have anything explainable. 
and also in general, it works well for generalization. Um, why? Well, just think about this. The memory equivalent capacities basically says each parameter memorizes each labeling of each point. Well, now let's say this. What if each parameter memorizes 10, the labeling of 10 points? The chance that if you have now an independent test set coming and one of these parameters can take over <coughs> to label the 11th point is much higher because obviously you can label anything by just adding even more parameters. So the chance that you have to add at a situation where you actually cannot anymore, add another parameter when, uh, uh, when you have a representation of like, let's say one, one parameter per 10 points is much lower than when you have a representation of one parameter per point. Right. So also, I cannot tell you, I have these, there's all these auto ML portals, right? So I go auto ML and I say, ah, let's try them. What I do is I generate random points and then report back, ah, I get a accuracy, super good model quality. Yeah, <laughs> random points, I wonder how you learn from them because I made sure that the period length of these random points is huge. So also, you can just either believe that or you believe that Occam, Occam, right? For all of them said, a competing hypothesis, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. I took that from Wikipedia and I don't know if they know that they have a joke because that's the big explanation and that's the other explanation. And if you go and do that, you already immediately know why Occam's razor is the right thing to do. Um, it's kind of a meta joke here. But the, does anybody know the original, original formulation of Occam's razor? The original original formulation was in Latin and translates like this. Don't multiply more often than you have to. Now, you think immediately of fractions where you say, okay, two divided by six should be one divided by three. That makes sense. But wait a minute. Don't multiply more often than you have to. We're talking about dimensionality here, remember? Parameters, independent parameters are each a dimension. And what is dimension? Nothing else but the number of times you have to multiply. We are absolutely, what we need to do here has been predicted by Occam. Okay, it's really interesting. The number of times you need to multiply should be minimized. So now, let's talk about generalization. So here's what's interesting. This equation is from the literature, not even from you, okay? And I think the delta should be here, but that's even a different story. I don't have papers, right. but this is a good equation. So what this is saying is, Give me two samples, one from the training set, one from the test set. And then I say, given some unknown way of measuring that distance, <laughs> okay, we don't know how to measure distance, but it's kind of some vector distance. If that vector distance is smaller than a delta, smaller than something, it should follow that the machine learner has the same result. So for example, you have a cat and a noisy cat, then there's not enough noise in the cat then it should still be a cat, okay? And of course, if you contradict the other way, if you do the contraposition for all delta existent these kind of things, guess what you get? You get the definition of adversarial examples, right? So the adversarial example is nothing else but saying, whatever you choose, you can, you, I, I gave you one where you thought you, you're cool with this delta, ha ha ha, I give you something smaller delta, with a smaller distance, and you classify it. So I don't want to go too much into the formal definition of this. Informally, what this means is when do two different inputs lead to the same machine on our outputs, right? Two different inputs lead to the same machine on our output, and they're sort of close enough for some acquired definition of close enough. Okay. Now what this means is when I think about it bits again, because hey, memory. Well, memory can generalize. Two Memory configurations are identical if and only if they are identical. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this identity function doesn't give you any generalization, but obviously the, the machine learner should give you generalization. So that means when are changed bits in the input not relevant to the output is what we really ask. Right, if you do this on a bit level, this is also nothing else but saying this is when can two bits be compressed into one, right? That's the same thing. Now that gives you a generalization measure right there. You say for binary classifier, 
take the number of correctly classified coins in bits, because these labels are just bits in the end of a table, divided by the number of coins capacity. This is nothing else but saying number of correctly classified points by the number of points that should be able to be correctly classified by this machine learning. Now, what you want is that this thing goes down. That means the number of parameters is reduced, and this thing goes up, right? So what you want is that with five parameters, you can classify 10,000 points, but you found the rule, right? right? So that's basically the point. This can totally happen. You could have, for example, just a linear separator, right? So you have two infinite amount of points on each one side and the other side, just one linear separator does it, and now that generalization is really hard. But not only that, in practice, you never have infinite. What I can say is, well, I have 20,000 points in my table, but for some reason, I need the same memory kernel and capacity as for 10 points. Well, that would be super awesome, but let's say uh, 5,000 points, right? So then you have a generalization of four to one in bits per bit. Four bits go into one bit. That's what it is. And that's all highly measurable. It's not so measurable. I haven't figured it out yet. How does that for sort of regression multi class, but it's still here. Number of points that could be correctly classified, and that is still right. So if you now go and say, I want to try this out, this is a bunch of abstract stuff. Here, it's TF meter, it's the appropriate level for you. What you do is um, you get on the left a couple of data sets, and then you click on them, it shows you the stupid network capacity and the expected, which is 14 bits in this case. Click on them. You can also get noise and all of this. Ignore the features for now. We haven't implemented yet that we filter the data sets by the features and then calculate the accuracy, uh, the capacity. We ignore the features for now. Now, what you do is you take those features in and you can hear plus minus hidden layers and also plus minus neurons in each of them. The output neuron is here. And then what you do is you press play and it will stay. So now people go and say, how is it that you describe all this as one scalar? I'm thinking about learning rate, I'm thinking about activation function, I'm thinking about regularization, whether it's L1, L2, all of this. I say, yeah, they matter sometimes. Really, real point is volume. This is basically volume. Capacity is like volume. How many things fit into something? It's a capacity, right? How many functions, how many points can you label? How many points do fit in my label? And it's independent of the shape, really. You know, it could be a bucket or it could be something else. Volume is independent of shape. And so that means different shapes here can have the same volume. But that is what matters. And it turns out if you add a bunch of neurons here, it doesn't add to the capacity, as I explained before. And you see that by these neurons not doing anything or by copying each other. <laughs> okay? And try that out. You will see how much waste we actually create by all these redundant neurons. Um, and also try all these different activation functions and different L1, and I'll try all of this out. Yes. Question. Can you try this with CNN? Oh, CNN is nothing else but a deep network fully connected, which is this, plus a convolutional layer. I can send you my, my, uh, uh, my publication where I said just replace those parameters that were randomly chosen for the convolution by a guy called Alex with the parameters that were chosen in hopefully a more intelligent way by the JPEG committee. And guess what? <laughs> it works. Okay. So what you do is these fixed parameters in front of the convolution are nothing else but filtering out bits statically because you can, because you're mostly killing noise. The same as the JPEG algorithm does. Okay. So take JPEG, go to quality, and just use a regular network. I did the same with audio, by the way. I used the lame encoder, same thing. The typical value you want is it's, it's about one bit per pixel, which is kind of funny. Um, I don't know why this came out this way, but we tried ImageNet, CCL places, um, some look for WC data set, um, uh, obviously MNIST, and also Cypher 10, and they all end up with the same. It's, uh, it's currently pending at ACM Multimedia. So, conclusion is, the lower level of generalization is memorization. The worst thing you can ever do is memorization. Now, I want for the debugging of my networks, I want to make sure that they can at least memorize, count on, 
right? This is the upper limit for the size of a machine learner is its memory coding capacity. If you go above that, well, if you like redundancies and you have the cycles and burning energy, fine, but it really doesn't do anything. The memory coding capacity is measurable in bits and uses, using a machine learner with over capacity, I guess, the rest of resources, but most importantly, these generalization undefined. Because generalization one is no generalization. Okay. Now, in general, I would say I'm, I'm cynical here, but it's true. I can be converted into chemistry by measuring. It's time to convert this decimal check and really just give me an accuracy without any units into actual science. And then we can go political and say, let's call that data science. <laughs> okay. Um, there is, however, a bunch of future work that I also want to talk about. So, first thing. Right now, is really rethink training. We NP complete, and we don't get to 100% accuracy. Come on. So when I think about memorization, I think about the fact that all that allowed that is allowed for something else to memorize something is an isomorphism. An isomorphism is the rejection. All I can do is permutate. There can be any reduction in anything, and we know the best case permutation. For example, in sorting is n log n, right? Could be even better, right? But I'm thinking of n log n mostly because we do have this nifty greater greater equal operator that we also use for sorting. So there's probably something there. But whatever it is, it shouldn't be NP complete. Okay? We need to find a different algorithm, and that means we find different assumptions, which means probably the assumption of smoothness to this calculus of that prediction is the one. Efficiency. If I had a solution, that would be great. I don't. Okay. But I think that's an interesting challenge. Okay. Now, how do we implement that Occam's razor by training? What I did here is saying train, go to 100% accuracy, reduce, train. So when I do this practically, I would actually halve the capacity all the time because these are low, mostly logarithmic curves. So that's not so bad. But what I really want is I want one training that figures out, oh, there's all this redundancy in this neuron. This neuron isn't really needed. Take, take out stuff that isn't needed, right? Um, next thing is, oh, what I showed you was neural networks. Of course, I have a guy, uh, Kingemeyer, uh, Philip Kingemeyer at Sanya. He comes and says, yeah, what about random forest? And he's right. I don't know. Good question. There should be a memory coding capacity for random forest. There should also be a random coding capacity for SVMs, right? Ultimately, there's a VC dimension for all of them, and what this is, the VDC dimension assuming random points, right? Yes. I assume, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of yeah. perfect. Okay. So, uh, there is a whole line of work that shows that um, uh, essentially like, we're having much bigger capacity in the networks help us explore uh, different architectures and also different initialized parts of the initialization space. And so yep. you start with an extremely large network, mm -hmm. and then you prune, and then even if like you retrain, uh, reinitialize the prune network, reinitialize, you would actually get to the same accuracy. Yeah. You just so have you to didn't mention like this whole line of here, like here. I can give you the explanation of how you interpret these results. Yeah. You go to Costco, okay? You go to Costco with a, you buy random shapes at Costco, okay? So now you go to Costco with a car that has exactly the capacity of your of what you buy at Costco. Sorry, I don't know. It could be Costco market. I'm just thinking Costco is my Costco example, okay? So you buy random stuff at Costco, and do you know you have exactly the capacity? Each volume is measured out. Now, how long will it take you to load the car when the exact when you need to measure the capacity exactly? It's been pen, exponential time. Now, if you take a car that's four times as big, it's four times the volume, well, that's great. You know what you do? You go and load the car. Done. And of course, it allows you to look at different architectures. But here's the problem. Can you predict where the items will end? No, you can. You cannot. Because there's a bunch of configurations that these items could be having. But for practical purposes. For practical purposes, they are measuring not generalization, they're measuring accuracy. And yes, you get 100% accuracy. All your stuff is in the Costco car. It's a new car from Costco. 100%. But can you generalize from that? No. Okay, so there's a, a different line of research where people are showing that over-parameterization is actually uh, extremely important for generalization. I assume that you're aware of that. Uh, so that makes no sense. 
I'm sorry. Okay. So the next thing I want to no, say. No, I mean, uh, do you no, have the other? I can then also give you one more thing that bias is sort of the line of research, which is you don't have perfect training. It's a real problem. That's why I'm saying training, training, training. The problem is if you train in some weird way that already introduces some bias, you can you can infer all kinds of things from that. I think the first thing we would need now to get to a more accurate notion of this is perfect training. Training that guarantees us if we have the capacity, we'd actually get to 100%. You did mention at some point that it's easier to train if you have the perfect capacity. Is that, did I get that right? Uh, I, if what you I'm have saying more is, capacity than you need, then it's harder, it takes longer to train. Well, obviously, in general, that's true because you have two to the power of n states. And if you just have n larger, then it's even more states exponentially. That's also why training specification is a big deal. Right. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, maybe this kind of goes along those lines. Uh, you're looking at all these things from a point where you look at memory <coughs> capacity and how can I like actually memorize that? But there's the other side that I don't know if you've looked into or touched is when you have really complex transformations that you have to make within the network, it's not just about the memory capacity. You need to have the capacity to actually approximate those functions. So, how does that hold? Because maybe that's maybe so, so the view the viewpoint is something I would have to understand. Because ultimately, think about it, memory equivalent capacity could be you could do this for polynomial, right? You could do memory equivalent capacity for anything. And in fact, this was really interesting. You know how memory equivalent capacity is actually used to practice every day on your hard disk. Because when you do LS minus L. You see a capa memory capacity in bits, but in reality, your hard disk, not only we you know it's sectors and operating system specific things that will, will expand this, but also there's an icing model below the hard disk that is very physical, that also has some kind of factor and we need to be done in these stores things and so on. In order to make this simple, the hard disk manufacturer says, well, when you do LS minus L, I give you the number of, of bits instead of if it was memory. Now you could say, but my files are all distributed in this way. I can save all of this. Yes. So use zip and get out some generalization or optimize your hard disk in some biased way so that these specific files can be stored in there. Okay, which is being done. Multimedia operating systems it was like a couple of decades ago they did this for images so we can store images more efficiently. I think it wasn't a spark. So these kind of things can be done. But if you say I want to store, I want to memorize random points, which is anything needs to fit, right? Then you get to the notion of memory equivalence. There's nothing else you can do. From there on, you can only, yes, you can compress in various ways, have various assumptions, but be careful, assumption biases you, right? So you can have various things to do to make things smaller. But the objective measurement is, if I need to reserve enough space, parameters, volume, to put in anything, what is that volume? And then when I do whatever I do, what is the volume and I'm ending up with? And that's, that quotient is generalization. Right. Okay, looks like that was a lively good discussion. And thanks yeah, for thank you. <laughs>